Kevin Lyman is the founder of Vans Warped Tour and has booked thousands of shows, worked with thousands of bands, and has mentored lots of artists, has offered a lot to probably a lot of our youth, right? To a lot of history of the first shows we've seen and some of our best memories going to shows. And last week, I posted a bunch of clips from past podcast episodes. I even posted a clip from Kevin Lyman. And I was digging through the podcast episode, and he has so much great wisdom and information to share and such great experience that instead of trying to find another clip from that podcast episode, I decided to post the full interview right here on on, on YouTube. So this is from podcast episode number 34. If you want to listen to the podcast version, I have the link below. And make sure you subscribe to the channel and leave a comment with your thoughts on the interview or maybe leave a comment with your first Warp Tour experience or fun Warp Tour memory. I hope you enjoy this interview with Kevin Lyman. Live the life you love. I am very excited to introduce you guys to Mr. Kevin Lyman. Kevin, welcome yeah, to the show. Doing, Chris? You know, it's nice to be here on a Saturday morning in Orlando. Yeah. Nice to see you. Beautiful weather. So for those of you that are listening, to add some context. It's a nice day in Florida, so we'll send you lots of love and sunshine. And we're down here for, for Florida Music Fest. Have you seen any cool bands at Florida Music Fest this year? I have. Year? I saw a great blues guy yesterday, yeah. Sal P, and he was good. And uh, just kind of wandering around seeing music and enjoying downtown Orlando. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice place and, you know, close. You can walk to all the venues. So yeah. that's what I like about this uh, event, that, you know, everything's right right at hand yeah it's, it's great it's great to have it's not overcrowded or too too crazy yeah so i'm sure the festival organizer would love to be a little bit more, a little more crazy <laughs> yeah you know it's, it's interesting i think he's the dynamics but there's a lot going on down here in orlando this time of year there's uh, earth day birthday today over yeah. at the fairgrounds there's a it's lot. record store day today yeah record store day so hopefully people are out behind records yeah absolutely so before we get started um i wanted to ask you you, before you started Warp Tour, before you started the first one, you wanted to do this as like a one-time thing and then become a school teacher. And even though education is such a big part of Warp Tour now, do you still have aspirations of becoming a teacher one day? I do, but I think I just, in, the, in this day and age, sometimes in the universities, I'd, I'd probably be maybe a little too controversial at times <laughs> to, to be there because... Uh, I, I always believe that you know education. My my professors and everything challenged me, mm -hmm. and some of the things they challenged me on would probably have been taken as offensive now when I read about you know offensive words right. or issues. But that's what I think. Sometimes our country got in trouble because we you know we have to be able to con fight through uh, adversity and challenges. Mm -hmm. and, you know, no one should be disrespecting each other, right. but we should we, we realize that life there is going to be disruption and we have to get through yeah. it. Yeah, we should be able to learn how to talk about these t tough topics, yeah. especially today. And, and I know a lot of professors are not addressing tough topics anymore in schools. And I think that's kind of got what is kind of in the situation we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before we get into it, what was your first concert and your first album you've ever bought? Some well, tribute to record My first album what I bought was uh, Simon and Garfunkel's Greatest Hits mm -hmm. and for a talent show. And I think I did Cecilia okay. was uh, the song we did. Uh, it was kind of weird in first grade, I think. But um, <laughs> then we, uh, the first concert that I really remember, there was a vague memory of one in Golden Gate Park. Mm -hmm. But we were there on family vacation, and I think we were trying to go to the, the, the museum or the aquarium, and we wandered into a Summer of Love concert. And, oh, wow. And I think it was Diana Ross. I'm not oh, quite wow. sure. But my first real concert was Van Morrison at the Hollywood Palladium. Oh, that I really, awesome. that kind of sparked on me of, like wow this is really cool yeah that's a great one to, to start your yeah. concert journey off with yeah very cool so i'm gonna start off with a little bit about branding and of course vans is a huge sponsor collaborator and sponsor of warp tour and a lot of people that don't really know what warp tour is might even think that vans and warp tour are like putting on the event on together and vans just like launched a new line with urban outfitters right, right at the announce of um the, the tour is there any correlation with how well Vans does to how well Warp Tour does in that year? Or mm, not, not necessarily. You know, that's the thing. They're, they're a shoe company, and I produce festivals. Now, mm -hmm. we have some uh, synonymous relationships and partnership. We are a partner on this event. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of successful is based on if the kids come out right. or if other brands are supporting it. Mm -hmm. And sponsorship has always been this topic in business where people are trying to figure out, you know, is it cool or not? But... You really don't survive without it a lot of times. Yeah, absolutely. I just read this cool thing about sponsorships. So millennials 
respect brands. 98% of millennials respect brands more that um, sponsor events. So that's kind of cool to see. And yeah, and, and I think that's the thing. You know, they said they thought they were going to go to social media marketing was going to mm-hmm. be the the easy way out. Right. I think that was the easy way out for a few years. But that experiential activations and being tied in closely with great events, mm-hmm. I think really people see that. And mm-hmm. if they're getting a great feel like they're getting a value from that event, they're going to perceive that brand is helping to bring that value Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're starting to see people dust off their old experiential vehicles and and get (laughs) out there and uh, bring more you know things to the shows right how do you because i'm sure there's a lot of companies that want to sponsor warp tour and you probably have the luxury of maybe even turning some sponsorships down like how do you select who is a good partner for the tour well i wish it was that way you know but (laughs) it's 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 tricky with warp tour because it's a hard tour you have to have a brand that's really committed to it because Mm -hmm. we are moving as fast as we do, right? Uh, we hit 42 cities. Uh, the kids are really engaged. Mm-hmm. I've actually had brands say, "Wow, the kids like I keep running out of things to give the kids because they want it so much." Right? And I'm like, "Well, isn't that successful?" Yeah. <laughs> but it would seem like it almost was a burden for him to to do that. But you know, it's nice this year. Brands who maybe have gone away for a couple of years, like Hard Rock or Skull Candy now as they're relaunching their wireless headphones and stuff, mm-hmm. came back to the original place that they started marketing in music, mm-hmm. and they're back with us again. That's very cool. So in one of your TED Talks, the, the Walmart, Walmartization of uh, music festivals, you talked about like how the, the biggest uh, need for um, people is like the age group that's 24 to 29, year old, 29 years old. Yeah. Like a lot of festivals don't cater to that audience. And a warp tour is mostly thirteen to nineteen right now. Like, what do you do to cater to that audience, or uh, what's think, something you wish you would do? I think you know we're talking about trying to. You know, I think this year, I, you know, some of the artists that we've been bringing back recently, mm-hmm. they're they're going to relate with those with that old, a little bit older crowd. I, mm-hmm. I, I hope they can come out, yeah. you know, and try to give them their one day. Mm-hmm. But there, you know, this thing still comes into economics and and how much time they have. Right. Uh, you know, we all t- we you know we hold, and I guess the gold standard of festivals in America is Coachella, mm-hmm. but. Coachella is driven by more than music. It's right. driven by the location, and it's now a place where all the celebrities go. Mm-hmm. And I was unique. Uh, I was talking to a, a person who asked, who'd you like at, at Coachella? And they go, Lady Gaga was awesome, which <laughs> she is. Right. And I go, what else did you do? And then they go, well, I saw all these celebrities. And they had kept them a running list on her phone. Mm-hmm. So wow. that's a lifestyle mm-hmm. that they've built out there that's built around as much as the environment. It's so beautiful out there. Mm-hmm. And, that, and then the music is part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the standalone music festivals, it's it's tricky. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of I think we've hit, we've hit that festival bubble. I've been mm-hmm. talking about it for a few years now. Right. Yeah. And I know a lot of people are. It's 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 a tricky year out there for festivals, mm-hmm. and we're going to see less of them. Yeah. Hey, you were talking about yesterday at UCF that a lot of festivals are starting to go away, and like really great festivals are, are going yeah, away. Yeah. Name, name you know names with big names and really cool festivals. You know when you open them up each week, you open up uh, you know some of these reports we get. And last week it was Mysteryland, which mm-hmm. well, I was I never got to go personally, but it was a fantastic festival. Mm-hmm. But then you're seeing like you know Okeechobee, like we were talking yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems to be thriving in its environment. And I was really impressed, like, like looking at that video, because the first thing I go to is production sometimes. Right. And some of these festivals are so over the top in production, but production gets very, very expensive. Mm-hmm. And they had a very clean, nice production, but mm-hmm. not over the top. Right. So obviously they're building it off of the environment mm-hmm. of where, where they're at, as mm-hmm. well as the, the, the well-curated show. So, you know, I guess I sometimes get a little bit... Uh, Maybe that inner jealousy kind of thing a little bit. Not just not any more creative jealousy because, mm-hmm. you know, with Warp Tour, we have, it's all about efficiency and speed. We mm-hmm. have to move down the road. We have to keep working every day to be able to afford to keep this tour on the road. Sure. Uh, but to watch the art installations and all the things going up mm-hmm. and the beauty of those shows, sometimes my old set designer creativity kind of thing comes out. And I go, right. God, I wish I could do more of that. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of brands, I mean, one of the biggest challenges of brands is building longevity. And you've built great longevity 22 years already of of this festival yeah. what do you attribute this longevity to because i know you have a lot of great creative marketing ideas such as like letting the parents in for free not starting not announcing the lineup till 11 o'clock every day and changing the lineup every day like a lot of great marketing strategies so do you think those are part of the longevity or what i, I, I think that those are some of the things that keep us going but i think it's it's familiarity in some ways mm-hmm. uh, people are go what's new for warp tour i go we're just we t- do minor tweaks on it mm-hmm. but it's still supposed to remind you of that accessible backyard party you went to mm-hmm. 
it, in, you know, in your friend's backyard. Right. Ba- ba- you know, backyard shows. It, it's, it, you know, the stages are the same. The production's mm-hmm. kind of the same. We, we tweak things inside for the where the culture's gone. And mm-hmm. a lot of that's going with the nonprofits that are out with us mm-hmm. now. A lot of them are addressing issues that maybe in, in schools and things they can't, like with Voice for the Innocent or right. Hope for the Day. And, you know, addressing teens uh, that are giving them resources for issues they may be going through. But musically, it just kind of tweaks each year a little bit. This mm-hmm. year, obviously, seems like a little bit more of a harder year, kind mm-hmm. of um, a year. that Some of it's dictated because of the environment I think the music's kind of going towards. Mm-hmm. And the other part of it is that that's who ava- that's available. Mm-hmm. You know, I know a lot of kids are like, where's these bands? Well, a lot of them did it last year. Right. So with, with touring and festivals becoming so worldwide mm-hmm. that, you know, these bands have to go to South America. They're right. going to Asia and they're going to Europe. Mm-hmm. So to think that they can just play on our, the warp tour every year is just not going to happen right sure and you, you always have to stay current because your audience is 13 and 19 and your audience is changing every year so you kind of have to stay current with the audience and, and that's too. where we're trying to balance it out mm-hmm. enough of the new stuff enough things to interest that crowd as well as then maybe get some people back and give them a day that mm-hmm. you know even though we've hit that $50 mark in a lot of markets that includes your parking and your facility fees mm-hmm. and all those kind of things sure. and built into that ticket it's still a place where you can go enjoy a festival mm-hmm. and if you see a few familiar names on it then you're, you're going to find two or three new bands that sure. you totally like I mean a lot of times now if you go to an arena show you're going to pay more than 50 bucks so 50 bucks for all those bands is it's yeah, an amazing and, and, deal. and it's getting trickier to put out mm-hmm. the, to be honest Mm-hmm. So I, there's this book that I, that I read called 22 Immutable Laws of Branding. I don't know if you're familiar with it. No. But since we're talking about branding, if you had to put together like your, your top five rules of branding for an artist or for a brand to build longevity like you have, what would those be? And some examples would be like you know collaboration, uh, consistency. I think there's the consistency we talk about the brand. I think there's an identifiable more identifiable image. Mm-hmm. So that arrow that I designed, that I put together. Yeah, yeah. Back in 1996, has mm-hmm. become kind of iconic. We just announced the the 19 uh, going over into uh, Japan with Punk Spring, and oh, all cool. they did was show the arrow, mm-hmm. and the kids cheered. They kind of even in Japan, they knew what it was. Mm-hmm. So that's been good. Uh, do what you know when you work with brands for branding, or you bring people in and partners. Do what you say you can do for them. Mm-hmm. Don't exaggerate. Don't right. say just because I fulfill your requirements. Uh, Gosh, you know, it's stay. Just try to stay true to what you believe in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, and something I actually haven't heard you answer on any like the interviews I watched, and that, that might seem like a common sense question that every band wants to know: How does a band get on Warp Tour, and how does like an unsigned band get on on Warp Tour? Well, it's it's now we talked about that a little bit yesterday. It was mm-hmm. you know I want to get some unsigned bands, and there's always a couple on each tour they can mm-hmm. submit to me. Everyone does, you know. It's it knows they how submit to, directly or submit directly to me. You know, as an unsigned band, you're you know. Uh, better to to reach out to me direct because right. you, you know if not you're going to have a team of people you're going to have your agent your sure. your re- label the band members are going to do it on one end but if you're an unsigned band you reach out to me directly I, I try to find someone that that's got a plan mm-hmm. because it it it's weird you build it out there and so you want to build a great show but those half hour sets are so valuable to right. the future mm-hmm. of where music's going mm-hmm. that you want to find people that you could build on to eventually get them up to the main stage. Sure. Uh, we need to continue developing bands that can keep moving up. Mm-hmm. So this year, that you know, the, the really the lot of the thought went into that full sale sa- mm-hmm. stage. That was really a lot of which of these bands do I think have the most potential to move up to that n- next level. Mm-hmm. And when when you say you were looking for a plan, like what are you looking for in their, their plan? You know, that, that, that either they're going to have some great touring behind the tour, mm-hmm. or they have a, a, a real record coming out, mm-hmm. or they also such have a, such a great local fan base, and they mm-hmm. can show that they, there's a lot of need for them outside of where they've gotten to play. Sure. Which you have, there's tools online you can use now, and have a, some great songs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For example, you talked yesterday about Beavis and Our Money Makers, how mm-hmm. they. You, it's so hard for a band to get out of Florida. You said the biggest curse to being in Florida is Mississippi, <laughs> Alabama, Southern Georgia. I, yeah, and I and yeah. trust me, I it's no offense to those places, but yeah. it's just honestly, there's a geographical border. It seems like for music, sure, a and, lot of bands don't want to tour into Florida because yeah, of, because and of that. and yeah, Florida is you know because you have to drive through those states. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've never done a warp tour in Alabama or Mississippi. Right. We do Atlanta, mm-hmm. but it's a it's a haul to get over here. We have to sure. kind of skirt it. We've we've now been able to bridge. New Orleans into it, mm-hmm. Nashville, but there was a big buffer there to this type to music that tended to be played down here. I was always wondering why you know all the surf reggae bands that kind of broke were the ones right. from California, right? When there was a lot of good ones from down here. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Totally true. A question I want to ask, uh, if you were to start all over again, knowing what you know now and you had to promote a club show, what would you do to make that club show more of an experience and an event? Oh, God, I worked in so many club shows. You know, I, I, it's been a long time since I've done a club show. How can you change the feeling of a club show? I think you know, getting a few tables in there, a few nonprofits, you mm -hmm. can create your own little mini festival within a festival mm -hmm. uh, of that. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, try to have a surprise act on the show. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, you know, have the three bands that are playing the club show, but try to find someone to come out and do an acoustic song or mm -hmm. be part of it. Try to create more of an atmosphere around the show. Mm -hmm. That's a cool idea. I love it. So when we get into some entrepreneurial stuff, uh, so you, you're like a serial entrepreneur. You have a lot of different businesses uh the saint archer brewery is a business you had and, and sold uh, the label you're now launching a coconut water company i heard yesterday a bamboo toothbrush company yeah we just yeah we were just emailing last night on that yeah plus yeah. ultra yeah <laughs> that's great, really cool so what are some lessons you've learned from running warp tour that you now apply to all these other companies and well, same vice versa yeah it's vice versa you know it's, you, well if you're going to be going into things fine try to find things that you can thread through your everyday conversations mm -hmm. uh the beer was natural the coconut water feels natural talking about Haley williams and a good die young hair dye mm -hmm. right the, the the bamboo toothbrush has been a little tough like how do you thread <laughs> that one in but trying to bring a thread to all the brands that i work with so they can complement each other at times mm -hmm. uh I think, you know, it's it's going to be, you know, you look for someone that's really passionate about the brand that you can support with your strengths. You know, when Haley Williams, she's a powerful brand in herself, mm -hmm. but she's looking for some, look for investors. She found people with strengths in mind, maybe in music and branding. Mm -hmm. uh, they've, she got, there's people in cosmetics that came in mm -hmm. and there's a, 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 an entrepreneur in the internet that came in and now the CEO can now pull it all together and really drive it forward. Mm -hmm. So you think like partnerships is a big uh, important piece to building these other businesses? Y yeah, and you have to have people that are driving the companies for you. Mm -hmm. Like well, I drive Warp Tour mm -hmm. for it, but when I, even on my other festivals, you know, John Reese used to drive Mayhem Festival. Right. I would support him, but he drove it every day. Mm -hmm. So Bill and Joe run Side One Dummy with Thomas right. every day, mm -hmm. but then I can help whenever I can. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I try to be an active investor. I, mm -hmm. I don't like passive investing. I, you know, passive investing is, is uh, Wall Street and your stocks and things, and I'm, I'm moving much more away from those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cool that you're really involved in those companies. Oh, we were talking about yesterday how you literally would go to venues with the brewery and trying to get your Oh, yeah, into those I had so much fun <laughs> with St. Archer's. That was just really fun. I you know, learned more about craft beer than I ever thought I would. Mm -hmm. Still not an expert. I couldn't yeah. tell you really exactly how to make beer, but I knew all the pieces of the parts of the puzzle to get to that point because mm -hmm. they all cost about $100,000 each. Sure. You know, <laughs> but um, it, was, it was a fun, it was really, really fun. Yeah. And a big piece to, to running a business is, is time management. I want to like kind of hear like how you manage your time, but like in three different phases, because like there's obviously a way you have to manage your time to get to where you are now, and like like know how you're managing your time now. But maybe the phases would be when you're running 320 shows a year. How are you managing your time? And beginning of Warp Tour, and how does well, that? And you have today? to think about that. 320 shows a year, we were running without really the internet. Right. Uh, we were not using the internet. We were using mail to mm -hmm. start off with contracts and writers. Everything was in the mail. And uh, then the fax machines came, <laughs> and there were like the roll with the ink paper, <laughs> and it would all fade if it got you know one drop of water or got too hot. Right. And I literally had two boxes of Manila folders, and I still work off of Manila folders a lot. Mm -hmm. I have them up in my room for the right. next three or four things I'm working on. And we would just have a box, and I would have it in my car, and I just <laughs> pull it out, and like, okay, that's done. Like, oh, this is the shopping I need to do for this catering right. show, done. And it was just like just plowing through just plowing through and and even now it's i just have such a great staff that mm -hmm. uh they're they're so competent in what they do that they come to me about 10 percent of the time it's almost too much like i used to be so <laughs> micromanaged everything mm -hmm. that it's allowing me to you know start thinking and I, I have to realize it's only really been since september we closed the in august we, we moved the office to the back house we kind of restructured the company the way it is mm -hmm. and i've had so much extra time I had a couple of people that were taking a lot of time in the company and they're gone mm -hmm. that, I, that I'm now starting to really think but I have to slow down a little because I'm thinking oh maybe we can do this or let's right. jump into this or let's go and make that bill <laughs> maybe you have free time yeah. when to start another business yeah I'm going to start another <laughs> business and I really need to you know, maybe take care of myself a little bit this, this travel's definitely been a little breaking at the point right now mm -hmm. that's really tough when you're living like a nightlife and you're working shows all the time to make time to take care of yourself that's yeah you know I, I feel bad now, well, I don't feel bad, but when kids come up and say, my showcase is at midnight, you know, after 
we get up and we yesterday we had a busy day we, right. we taught all day long and and you put a lot I, I think you you realize i put a lot in everything i do mm -hmm. so absolutely teaching that class yesterday it's pretty i get into it and then mm -hmm. i sit outside and talk to everyone for about two hours afterwards right. and i was exhausted mm -hmm. and that's you know that was like a four and a half hours then we had to go to an event to kind of meet the owner of the school right and, and those people and i just was like sitting in a chair i was tired <laughs> came back and it's like oh we got 30 minutes before they want you to come to an event right and i'm like i gotta rest for a minute here and, and then go out mm -hmm. but you know by and I, kids were run up but can you and, and i i don't want to disappoint them but i gotta look out for them it's like i, I last by last night about i had eaten really so i mm -hmm. ate and about led 10 30 11 o'clock, I had to come back and watch a rerun of Blue Bloods and fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny that we were talking about booking shows before there was even fax machines and the internet. So one of my mentors, uh, I don't know if you know Sonny Schneido from House of Blues in New Orleans. Yeah. He just uh, recently retired, and I worked for him for, for a couple of years. And one day I was working, and you know he's booked shows since the 70s at, T at Tipitina's. And I turn around, and I ask him, like, how did you book shows in the 70s? Yeah. I'd, I'd love to maybe hear your, your answer to that and your, your stories. <laughs> Well, I, it, I mean, was, it was 80s. basically, you know, you called, I mean, Gary and, and Paul Tolette were booking most of the shows. Mm -hmm. Paul, who runs Golden Boy, you know, Coachella now, was like kind of the booking side. And mm -hmm. then they had a little office and they would, book, but it was mostly a phone call. And mm -hmm. then you'd agree and then they'd mail you a contract right. and then you'd sign the contract and mail it back. And then they would get a writer and, you know. Then I'd they'd put a pie, and then I'd go and pick up all the writers for all the shows, mm -hmm. and you know it was a, definitely a process. Mm -hmm. It was definitely time consuming, right. and, and, but I don't think we were producing. We were producing a lot of shows, but mm -hmm. I was working for multiple, doing a lot of different multiple events and things. Sure. But you could have never been like a live nation now, where they've got twenty thousand shows on yeah, sale or something insane. like that worldwide. There's no way. Mm -hmm. That's funny. When I asked him that question, like his, he said. Uh, you pick up the uh, you look in the phone book. You pick yeah. up the phone. You make a call. You get a contract, and, and then you send it back with some money. And you pray the band shows up. <laughs> yep, <laughs> it's cool. That's how it works. So when when starting a business, and especially like young people out there, like there's going to be moments where they feel discouraged or maybe not as motivated. Do you ever get those moments still? Oh. And how do you overcome? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's part of business is being discouraged and. Unmotivated. There's mo moments I get unmotivated because for me now, mostly that unmotivation comes when I see people, I've been doing this 35 years, mm -hmm. repeating, didn't learn from the mistakes of their past right. or, the, or the past, mm -hmm. maybe not their past, the past. Mm -hmm. And you can trace history of bands and I love bands I loved that I guess go, oh, they just made all the bad management decisions or all these bad decisions. Sure. And they would have been those bands that you wish would still be playing now. Mm -hmm. And then I come along and a few years later, I watch that band do that. And mm -hmm. I, you know, and I'll use it. I mean, and it was a few years ago. I thought Modern Baseball was mm -hmm. just going to be that band. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love that band. I thought they were so good. And I, and I approached them and, and they took that kind of approach like, well, we're not going to do this or we're too good for that or you know, we don't believe it. Right. Where I'm like, when you're starting out, you know, when people reach out that have been around, you should grab onto their arm and, mm -hmm. and be pulled up. Mm -hmm. um, and then they start hitting some roadblocks and now they're gone. Right. And I think they could have been a band that would have been around for 10, 15 years mm -hmm. as they developed. Mm -hmm. And you see those mistakes made a lot. Sure. So what do you do to overcome those moments of de demotivation? Or what, what, is there anything um, that you do to help When you? I'm demotivated now, unfortunately, I go plant more plants in my backyard. <laughs> and it's starting to look like a jungle. Every square inch of my land is, uh, is covered in, in something. It looks beautiful. We've yeah. got some rain in California, so it looks really nice. Uh, I just go do something else now. I, mm -hmm. it's, just kind of get your mind off of it. Yeah, it does get me frustrated. You know, it gets me frustrated, the the internet sometimes because I think these kids are shortchanging themselves mm -hmm. by passing judgment so quickly and blurting all over the internet something sure. or this and not taking a second to slow down mm -hmm. which we all had to learn too we had to right. learn that slow down and think for a second before you send that email yeah, in business absolutely. slow down or maybe pick up that phone mm -hmm. but I'm watching these people just write each other off so quickly mm -hmm. and I think we're doing that on a macro scale and then you can take it to a micro scale of right. music that just like, and then I hear bands talking like, oh, I don't want to tour with that band. I don't like that band. I'm like, guys, you're all musicians. Mm -hmm. You should be under a community right now. If anything, you should be pulling together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's so important for bands. Because yesterday in, in Orlando, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of good talent in this town. And we yeah. are talking about you don't have to go to necessarily to L.A., New York, or Nashville. Like, you can just all collaborate and work together here and just build a scene here locally. I think, you know, you really could here in Florida. Mm -hmm. It would, you know, Florida's always had this kind of... 
connotation of some shystery guys down here. Right. You, know, you can go yeah. all the way to Pearlman, all sure. the way you know, on from that point on. But I think there could be a true, honest music scene that, that, that was guided by tech in many ways. Mm-hmm. Spotify and the Pandoras mm-hmm. and, and things, and built out of Florida. But it's going to take some smart, young, honest entrepreneurs to do it. Because sure. I even last night, I'm, I'm walking around, and I remember some of these faces that, that lurking around young bands mm-hmm. and things. And they were all there. They were out last night. Right. And they're kind of lurking around, telling them how they can help them and do this and this and this. I, I don't know... You, nowadays, it's going to be probably people more your peers that are going to rally up together and say, okay, we're going to tackle this as a group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And what, someone else coming up to you. Mm-hmm. What should a band look for in, in a manager or someone that wants to help them and do work with them? Do research on that person. It is very easy to do research on mm-hmm. people nowadays. Yeah. You can find out if they, they're legit. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can search the internet. You know, anyone that's legit and not, that's semi legit, <laughs> is going to have some sort of professional stuff on the internet about mm-hmm. them that sure. you, know, ac- you know we don't search for accomplishments in life but they'll come if you're doing good things mm-hmm. so if you search through you know they'll have a Wikipedia page and mm-hmm. they'll say what their businesses are or right. they'll have business reference page or their LinkedIn it'll be very positive mm-hmm. so do your research on people don't get sucked in at a bar at 11 o'clock at night by someone right. <laughs> take their card very nicely and just say hey I'll check I knew it right. and you can do some research mm-hmm. That's, that's really good advice. And what's the most common bad advice that you hear given out by, by people to young artists that are up and coming? Well, young artists that I can get you, you know, they, you know, they want to be your manager right away right. without even really getting to know you. Sure. Yeah. You know, that's so ju- quickly they're jumping to get you to sign something. Don't sign something with your first manager. Mm-hmm. Find someone and do a trial period. Yeah. Trial period with goals. Mm-hmm. So you can have... We're going to work together for six months. During mm-hmm. those six months, you're going to get us this. Sure. If you get these three points done for us out of five, mm-hmm. don't, you know, it doesn't have to be 100%. 60% right. success in this business is good. Yeah. If you can reach these attainable goals, we will extend that for another two years. or year. We can make a real deal out of it. Sure, yeah. yeah it's really important to one – yeah, the, the trial period. That's why I do all the time, like having – having a small little trial period because even as a manager you want to know what the band's work ethic is like and how your relationship's going to be because you might be you could have two really great people but if you constantly bump heads and just aren't don't have the same vision it doesn't work yeah it's, it goes back to that old you know old term that's probably not used anymore courting mm-hmm. you yeah. know, courting and then uh, or dating and then uh, <laughs> building a relationship and then you finally get married yeah. it's funny how people wanted you to get married the next morning yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so true that's exactly what it's like Tell me about a moment where something didn't go your way and the lesson that you learned from that moment. Oh, man. A lesson I learned was a, a really something that should have been so successful on paper. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rob Zombie, Haunted House. Mm-hmm. Kevin Lyman knows how to draw people in Southern California to events. John Reese, who knows. We, we built this, we got the biggest haunted house builder in the world. We built this haunted house and, and realizing I didn't know enough about Halloween. Right. Halloween was never really my favorite holiday. I would be always working or doing an event and realize that people didn't want to be, they want to be boo scared, like fun boo scared. Right. <laughs> and usually on a Groupon, like if they go to a haunted house. Uh, we built a haunted house that was more disturbing than scary. <laughs> and then we tried to blend in music. And we had some great concerts, the used and punk rock nights and things. But people who really want to be disturbed don't want the distraction of a concert. Sure. And the people that were going to the concert that went to the haunted house were like, oh, man, this is just disturbing. It's not boo fun. <laughs> and it was a complete disaster. Yeah. <laughs> and it was really great to work with Rob Zombie, though, because mm-hmm. he's, he's is such a creative genius. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just wish it had been in a different circumstance. Sure. Yeah. And I realized that I when, am not past a point in my life that I wanted to be sitting up at 2 o'clock in the morning <laughs> in a dark parking lot arguing with some guy. Or some guy wants to argue with me on the realist, how that art. Sharon Tate murder room wasn't realistic enough. <laughs> Is that the kind of people I want to be hanging out with anymore? <laughs> no, the time. I'm past that. So I just added that, you know, Halloween at haunted house. But I learned, and it was an expensive lesson. Mm-hmm. Sure. As, as promoting events is it can be sometimes very expensive lessons. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have this really cool new program on, on Warp Tour where fans can take lessons with musicians. Yeah. And it's a program that is, I guess, it's like a, a test period because it's something you want to make well, year-round. We've been a... doing it for a while now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be great if it would turn into a year-round program. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm only, a sp- you know, I, I was, uh, it was started with Matt Halpern and then myself and then pretty much uh, 
Jen Kellogg, our tour accountant, has now assumed that company. Mm -hmm. I kind of let her have that. Okay. Uh, because I was actually honestly getting a little frustrated with it. Mm -hmm. uh, because the artists were doing it on Warp Tour and they were doing such a great job with it and mm -hmm. they were kids were engaged in it. Right. But as soon as they would go on their own tours, they just went back to their normal shake More hands, routine, meet and greet. Yeah. Versus the VIP sure. pay me to meet me kind of thing mm -hmm. where these guys try to do and it just got frustrating to me mm -hmm. that uh, it was so successful during the run of the Warp Tour but the rest of the year so I, I try to focus on you know like we talk about so many things mm -hmm. focus on the things that I really think have potential sure because like you, you, I heard you talking in an interview about like how personal potential right because I heard you talk about the program where your one of the goals was to create an extra revenue stream for bands, yeah. especially you don't have to turn off the tour and kill themselves on the road all the time. And he did talk about like virtual using virtual reality with it. What impact do you think virtual reality is going to have on the, the music industry, and how soon do you think it's it's coming? I think you know virtual reality is going to be educational, experiential. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe people are going to. I really don't think it, people are going to sit on their couches and pay ten dollars to watch a concert in right. virtual reality. I hope not. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I if it does, then I'm done. I'm just yeah. like it, the world's passed me by. Yeah. Uh, it's still a social activity. It's still. Mm -hmm going with you and your friends and interacting spontaneously, you know, unless I guess you can tie it all together and there's six of you sitting on a couch sure. playing virtual reality concerts together, but <laughs> I, that'd be weird, <laughs> even weirder. <laughs> but, um, you know, some people are talking about how virtual reality is going to do it, but I think it'll be experiential. And that's why I talked the education process mm -hmm. that if let's say Matt Halpern was doing a drum lesson and you could virtually reality, like, zoom in to watch that little roll on his snare, mm -hmm. how he gets that cool. sound, or his kick pedal, how mm -hmm. he's working the kick pedal. I think those type of things could be used well in music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think there'll be a lot of value out of that for the young upcoming musicians to learn from their favorites, yeah. and also, as you mentioned, it create an extra revenue stream for musicians. Absolutely, and it's, you know, you know, some people go, God, you talk a lot about revenues, but, and I'm not talking like a lot of revenues. We're talking if a guy could go out and make a few grand a year teaching, mm -hmm. that would be really helpful in sure. people's lives and allow them to keep creating music. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you've started so many businesses and been part of so many different ventures. Do you have a entrepreneur bucket list of something that you haven't done yet that you'd like to try out one day? No, I am bucket list. I see, I, I don't really plan that far ahead. I was kind of going through <laughs> stuff of all my things yesterday mm -hmm. and, and looking at them where we're at. And I still have, you know, I have fiscal responsibility to my daughters and my mm -hmm, wife. Sure. And you don't want to get yourself too extended because mm -hmm. I've never taken a loan from anyone mm -hmm. except on my first house. Right. And uh, I, I, I don't like borrowing money. I don't want to, but I'm actually getting to that point where. Uh, it wasn't I, I, did, I made a better living than I would have ever expected in my life mm -hmm. um, I've been smart I don't live past my means so mm -hmm. I've been able to save some money mm -hmm. so now you know it's more experiential to me than maybe you have to be financial in mm -hmm. a lot of reasons sure that's a good lesson too though just the saving money part because there's so many artists that might have a really good year or two and then all of a sudden the following year nothing yeah, comes and it's so important to save money and live I've been saving a little bit since I was 20. Mm -hmm. I started just saving a few bucks a week. And that whole story about building it up over time, mm -hmm. it does work. Sure, absolutely. Because you, you started saving when you were 20, but you didn't really start Warp Tour until you were 32. 32. So yeah. you, were, you literally had tw 10 to 12 years of experience behind you before you even yeah. went into that, into that Yeah, I was willing. I, was able, I, I had the experience that allowed me to fail, and people supported me a second time. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what made you want to go back around and try it a second time after failing well, the first time? you know, the word, because I, I knew I was, I felt I would, you know, it went so, it went, the show went so well, but didn't go well ticket sales wise and everything, mm -hmm. but just the spirit that I was trying to bring to a tour. Mm -hmm. And when I got home, a lot of the people that maybe I wanted to play that first year that, you know, their agents or whoever, or they just weren't into it yet, mm -hmm. started stepping forth. And that, you know, mm -hmm. being the Pennywises and the No Effectses, you know, the mm -hmm. bands that I love to work with and looked mm -hmm. up to um, and looked or looked across to because we're all right. around the same demo, uh, that they started endorsing what I was doing. That's really cool. And it kind of goes along with what the lesson you gave yesterday, which is so important. Uh, patience and being nice is a really important part of success in, the, in this business. Probably any, any business, really. Period. Yeah, I think it's in, in. I think it's in any business. You know, there's there's like kiss ass nice, which I don't like. No, but the genuine, <laughs> just be nice to people. Yeah, that's, and that's actually a good segue into the, the next uh, part I want to get into, which is about giving back and and the next generation. And mm -hmm. philanthropy is such a big part of of Warp Tour. Where did that come from, and how did that whole 
passion for philanthropy start in, in you? Well, I think that the, the philanthropy part came, it was rooted in uh, growing up in Claremont, California. Mm -hmm. In Claremont, California was the Claremont Colleges, like Pomona College, mm -hmm. CMC. It was kind of a hippie town. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but when I was in high school, I started getting exposed to some people that were a little older, and they always seemed to be doing some sort of benefit for something. Mm -hmm. You know, the hands, of, or the walk across America, that ill-fated walk across America, and people got stuck in the desert. Right. All of a sudden, they're doing a little benefit show to raise money to get them home, and I guess they said they had, all they were eating was noodles, and, mm -hmm. and they had no, wish they had Parmesan cheese, and they <laughs> bought a, 40, a big 40-pound wheel and drove it out to the desert to these people. It was just this kind of spirit that, you know, if you have something, share something. Mm -hmm. It was just what I did. And then the punk rock world was kind of the same way. Mm -hmm. If I have something, share something. And that could be like, if I have a drum riser, I'll share it with you. Right. If I have some pizza, you can have some pizza. Right. If I have some beer, have a beer. Right. You know? If, when we get down to the last one, we'll fight over that one, you know? <laughs> you know, which we had some fights over beer. When I look back at people, pay, people that were like, you know, in our age group and, you know, I'm going, remember Martin Atkins, who's a great educator out there right now, and mm -hmm. how one night in a basement in a, uh, in a dressing room, me and him got over a fight over a six-pack of beer. And we did like $200 worth of damage to the, the venue, you know, <laughs> you know, for over a six-pack of beer. But uh, it's just a mentality that, you know, and then I try to teach people that when you have nothing, it's easy to give. Mm-hmm. Because you have nothing. Right. And if you just build, once you get a little, just give a little. Sure. You know, and just build it up. And I never, you know, even to this day, I don't want it to affect people's lives to give. Mm -hmm. But when I ask, there's, everyone's got, most people that would be coming to Warp have three extra cans of food somewhere sure. in, their, in their closet. Mm -hmm. Or an old cell phone. Mm -hmm. Or that quarter that comes off the ticket. Mm -hmm. Or wants to donate blood before. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not something that overall will affect your life too much by just giving a little. Yeah, But absolutely. when everyone gives a little, it adds up into almost you know, 460,000 pounds of food or whatever we did last mm -hmm. year. And that fed a lot of people. Yeah. And with the way they're taught, then the, we're going to need to do this more than ever. Right. Because, uh, you know, walking around Orlando, you know, I, I remember some homeless here, but there's a serious homeless problem. Yeah. Every city's it's having growing. it right now. It's growing. I mean, you can definitely see it here. Mm -hmm. And, Food pantries just for families, or if we get the budget cuts that are, they, they say are coming, uh, I said the other day that we should all get a brick in the wall and write what we lost from it. Mm -hmm. And whether that's going to be meals for seniors, right. or after school programs, or some of the homeless people here, probably the shelters won't have food for them. Right. So if we can do something, and I don't know, is it a drop in the bucket what we give? Yeah, but if you put enough drops in a bucket, mm -hmm. you can you can start to do good things with it. Yeah, and it's not just about money; it's about giving your time too. I give every yeah. person. I always say every single person gave just two hours of their time a month, or yeah. three cans of food per month, and everyone did this. Imagine like how much different things. Yeah, things you know, be. and that's one thing I don't have a lot of time. Right. But I create it through the programs I have. I always try to disperse it through the businesses and things we do mm -hmm. a little that's, bit. That's so cool. That's, that's so important. And another thing you also always say is um, music opens people up to fun and yeah. fun opens people up to education. Mm -hmm. What is something that you would like to see change in, in the education system, since, especially since you deal with so many um, kids in high school and middle school? Well, I, I think we need more counselors in schools. Mm -hmm. That's something I'm really shocked at. You know, mm -hmm. that, you know, when I talk to schools and they've got one counselor that's supposed to be there for 1,500 students or 1,000 students, mm -hmm. and their job is not only college counseling, but their job is, is, is emotional counseling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's no way that can be effective. Mm -hmm. There's no way those things. Or the schools have to make it alliances, because when we had our cards from Voice for the Innocent, those cards, I met educators in those marketplaces uh, who didn't even have those resource cards. So mm -hmm. we said, here, have some of these for your students, because... We have to work as a, you know, it takes the village to raise a child, as they yeah. always say. I guess that's a stealing a quote that I actually understand more of now. And I think that village has been really depleted. Mm -hmm. And and kids need help. Uh, you know, I, I watched, you know, the development of my kids. And, and luckily, you know, I work hard. And I guess I've worked hard for their education to give them the opportunity. But how influential some of those those counselors have been. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we can do what we do as parents. Right. But having people that understand your child. And, and there's just no way. And, and I know all these counselors are so well-meaning. And they mean so. But it's just they don't have the time. Right. Yeah, it's so true. I just watched uh, 13 Reasons Why on Netflix. Have you, have you seen no, that show? No, I haven't seen that it's, yet. It's very, very powerful. And it's you know, about suicide awareness and about, about this girl that, that killed herself. I've and heard th about 13 that. 13 Reasons Why she, she did. And, and yeah, having 
good counseling in school and like yeah like and it, the counselor was one of the reasons in in that in that show and like he meant well and he wanted to help the girl but it's like yeah I mean, they, they just need more resources or training or education yeah so, it's so just important. it's well i think the education is but like i I, th- I think i put up my twitter yesterday or the other day that you know just you know high five a teacher right it's the end of the year yeah you know high five because they're they get they have thankless jobs and they they work so hard for you mm-hmm. and uh it's funny how many teachers reached out to me i didn't know how many teachers follow yeah. me on twitter <laughs> and i got a couple nice letters from people that saying thank you thank you for just recognizing that mm-hmm. you know i became a teacher big one one was i became a teacher because i came to the warp tour right oh wow and i fell in love with music and this and this it inspired me to want to work with kids and do this and i was kind of in college and i was watching these people and I go, I want to work with those kids. He was a little older than maybe the, some of the fans there. Mm-hmm. And he wrote me that how it's inspired him to teach. That's really cool. That's a great story. Yeah. It's, and yeah, it's so important to appreciate the teachers because like, they're, they're underpaid, uh, work, work really, really hard for, for what they do. And they're impacting our, the next generation of yeah, the future. I, it is. It's, it's tough being a teacher. Speaking of education, you speak a lot at, at college campuses, and there's a lot of music business programs coming up now, and entertainment business programs. What would you? What is something that you would like to see those kids learning in those programs before they go out and work? And if you're going to go to one of these programs, make sure they're doing events and concerts. Mm-hmm. You need that experience. You Absolutely. Need, and you need that experience. And I say, go do anything. I and mean, I always even say, go go work for a wedding planner. Mm-hmm. That's like a encapsulate its own music festival in a short amount of sure. period. Yeah. You see the stress, you see the frustration, you see having to think on the spot. You only get one take. Mm-hmm. Get as involved as possible. Uh, the instructors need to keep current mm-hmm. because things are changing so quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully these instructors have someone, hopefully a student, right. scanning and giving them bullet point sheets every day. Mm-hmm. What happened today? Mm-hmm. You know, Spotify decided that they're going to give all the information on analytics out to the artists. Mm-hmm. The That's huge yeah. because brands always thought they own their analytics and data. They were right. always so protective of it. Have Spotify say, we're here to help you. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. Last week it was TuneCore. Mm-hmm. TuneCore announcing that they're going to do grants to help band develop their career. Right. Uh, You've got to be on your game each and every day to stay current. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And speaking with young people, the current generation on, on Warp Tour is Generation Z, the, the, or the, the okay. I generation. What do you think their values are, their wants and needs, and does it make you optimistic about the future compared to the us, us entitled millennials? Well, yeah, well, no, you know, the millennials, <laughs> I got my next book, I should have brought it down here. I just got <laughs> it. It's, uh, it's uh, Baby Boomers, a generation of sociopaths. <laughs> mm-hmm. And how we set you guys up for who you are. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, I just got the book. I yeah. haven't even gotten a really glance at it. I just read the synopsis of it, and, and I decide that's going to be the next book after I read this, A Colony Within a Nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but everyone is so tuned in. That's one thing that's come. And I heard a friend brought this up the other day. We were talking about what's happened with them. And we said, at least the rock's overturned and all the cockroaches are out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we just see how our... Our system has been somewhat infiltrated by self-serving and, and special interests. Mm-hmm. That generation that is young, seeing that, I mm-hmm. don't remember being that politically tuned in, yeah. <laughs> at, or potentially at 11 to 15. Some of these, some of the kids I'm talking to, mm-hmm. some of them are just don't care and they're doing what they do. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them are really starting to question things. That's, and that's if you start questioning things at an early age, I know parents hate me saying that, mm-hmm. but that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that means you have time to help formulate smart ideas on how to change it. Mm-hmm. And speaking of, of of parents and questioning things, I heard you talk about on this podcast called Rad Parenting the importance of because sometimes kids don't maybe get vocal or talk about stuff to their parents, and you're talking about when they they do to kind of just shut up and, and listen and the importance of that. Yeah, you know, I've learned that sometimes they just need to talk, and once they mm-hmm. open up, just sit back and listen. Mm-hmm. Um, don't try to, you know, and I've got that problem. I think I have a solution for everything. Right. <laughs> so I had to learn. Not, they're not looking for a solution right now. They just want you to listen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's so important for letting, allowing them to talk and have their voice and also listening to yeah. what, they're, what they're saying. Because if, if you constantly suppress that, then who knows what, what issues that yeah. could cause. Yeah. And you're talking about um, reading books. And I saw you were reading when, when I got here. Do you have any recommendations of, of books or documentaries that you think people should check out? I mean, I've, I've been blowing through a lot of books on, you know, on American culture right now. I just fil- fil- finished Hillbilly Elegy, mm-hmm. which was a fantastic book. I think, it, yeah. It's a great I book. Um, I think it's a great book for, for people who, who may have not voted a certain way, who 
want to understand why those people voted a certain mm-hmm. way. Uh, I thought it was a great understanding of, of, of the mindset mm-hmm. of people and it basis comes out of the Appalachians and, and how they, the Apple, people out of the Appalachians filled all the factories. Mm-hmm. And, and now the, the, the frustrations. And then now I'm reading this book, you know, that I'm finishing a colony in a nation. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it analyzes and breaks down how we've gotten to places like Ferguson and mm-hmm. Baltimore and some of these things that are happening. Not necessarily blaming the people directly involved, mm-hmm. whether it was the officers involved or the victims or the people that were, were shot involved. Um, it's, it's actually going deeper to how this has led to these kind of reactions and these kinds of instances and how we have so many run-ins like this mm-hmm. on a regular basis now and how so much of it is set up before that actual altercation happens on the streets. Mm-hmm. The mindset of, the, of we live in a nation under siege in some right. ways. Do you, do you spend a lot of time reading? Because like Warren Buffett, I think he, I heard a stat, he reads like four hours a day, and that's part of what makes him uniquely him. Do you, do you spend a lot of time reading? I, I spend a, yeah, I spend a lot of time reading now. I, you know, but I still like to, to read a couple newspapers, mm-hmm. and I try to read at least you know, an hour of, the, you know, of a book whenever mm-hmm. I can. Lately, I've been reading quite a bit with all these cross-country flights. Right. Um, I, sit yeah. there and <laughs> read the, I sit and read the books and then look out over our country and go, 99% of these people just want to live in peace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So true. And with, with all the, the reading you do and all the, the different generations of, of young people that you've seen over the last 22 years. So let's say uh, you probably have witnessed your, your worst dad nightmare already of, of the daughters dating and, <laughs> and everything. But when, you're, the day, when the day comes when you have grandkids and your grandkids ask you for three values or lessons of, of life, uh, what would you tell them those three values or lessons would be? Well, you know, the... the Try to under, put yourself in that other person's shoes and where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. That's always a, a thing I try to do is understand where they're coming from. Uh, two, it's okay to fail. Fails, yeah. Failure is part of that thing. And three, just don't date a guitar player. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so I have a couple of Facebook questions before I get sure. to my, my wrap-up questions. One of them is from Ariel Riley. She's actually a full sale student and one of my uh, former students. She wants to know what happened to Country Throwdown and what you consider bringing it back. Uh, Country Throwdown, I think, was, was timing was perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, culture of Nashville wasn't ready for me. <laughs> to be honest, yeah, it really was. We were trying to go in there. And so was just, it in Nashville? You know, we, we toured it. We okay. toured it out of Nashville. Okay, and it, it was it's, the the Nashville market has developed a lot more since mm-hmm. we did that. I think we were ahead of the game as we tend to be in some right. of these things. <laughs> and I helped, I met more resistance to something that was really cool mm-hmm. than they didn't want to change at that point. That mm-hmm. was you know uh, Nashville has changed a lot in just the last five years, but we went in there 10 years ago and tried to just, dis- we were disruptors. Right. <laughs> and I don't want to repeat it on your podcast, but I heard some crazy things that I hadn't heard in like ages about how things were in Nashville and mm-hmm. things aren't going to change. And, right. and they would, I, people in Nashville didn't want me in Nashville. Mm-hmm. Was it like the similar kind of concept of, of warp tour? Was it like the, a, a touring the, the idea festival? was yeah a touring country festival with young artists we you know i guess the claim of fame i had was florida georgia line called mm-hmm. my barbecue around for 500 bucks mm-hmm. they wow. were those bands you know mm-hmm. the eric churches the brantley gilberts uh, those kind of people that are now household names in a lot of ways but this was before they weren't pretty boy dress up cowboy guys going into radio stations right. uh, they were rebels mm-hmm. and uh you know tying it in with you know i learned what texas you know everyone goes there's texas country and nashville country right and i go texas i learned what it is mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Texas country was country with an opinion. Yeah. And they didn't dress up pretty for the radio stations, you know? <laughs> so Jamie Johnson, who I think is one of the best songwriters of, of so long, mm-hmm. and just because he didn't conform, mm-hmm. he was kind of crushed down in that town. Mm-hmm. There's a really great scene coming out of like that, the Texas country and those types of artists now. Well, that's all because of the internet. Yeah. Well, the internet can't hold music back anymore. Mm-hmm. And the internet couldn't hold back Florida Georgia. They broke. They didn't break at radio first. They were breaking on the internet. Right. So radio couldn't ignore them anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And another uh, Facebook question. So this is a, another full sale student, Josh Davis. You're taking a festival on a cruise to, to Mexico and have been to Anchorage, Alaska. How do you decide where to expand the festival and to go into other uh, countries? It's finding good partners. You have to find someone that you can trust. So, mm-hmm. like, when we went to the U.K., it was Mark Walker, who was so great, and he's so great from Kilimanjaro. He's a great partner, understood the concept of Warp Tour, could express that to the people he worked with, mm-hmm. and then express that across Europe. So he would, when we went across Europe, 
crews, six-man crews, is uh, very tight, almost in like, conjunction with Warp Tour in some mm-hmm. ways, because so many people from the tour work on on the cruise ships mm-hmm. and uh, the woman who brought it there is engaged to a guy who works on Warp Tour <laughs> and she was really able to explain it and how we could make this work mm-hmm. so we great partners Japan they've approached me about doing it with mm-hmm. Punk Spring and Paco Zapata who uh, yes yes Trump before your wall he used to sneak <laughs> across the border and go watch punk rock shows yeah. and then sneak back across at night <laughs> he, he illegally came over to our country to watch, learn about punk rock that's cool and now he's promoting the show down in Mexico that's awesome so what, what is the, the cruise about because I, I know it starts off in, in New Orleans yeah it starts in New Orleans it's kind of based I was looking for that audience 25 to 40 mm-hmm. that maybe still wants remembers those fun days at Warp Tour so mm-hmm. kind of blending that kind of lineup mm-hmm. so by putting Good Charlotte and Simple Plan and 303 and then starting line, Juliana Theory, mm-hmm. and face to face. It's it's gonna be a fun. It should be a lot of fun. Yeah, it sounds awesome. I, I saw the lineup, and especially since leaving from New Orleans, uh, as we talked earlier, I'm, yeah. I lived there for a few years. My wife's from there. When I saw it, I was like, wow, that'd be something cool for yes. <laughs> to yeah. me experience. So you're hitting that target demographic target for sure. Target demographic. Yeah, we're doing like the uh, Dead Rock Star Ball for Halloween. Come as your favorite oh, cool. Dead Rock Star. <laughs> Uh, what are, I don't know. That's Ian, on the cruise? Yeah, on the cruise. we got all these theme parties that we're kind of coming up with right now. That's cool. And then does there, how many stops are there along the way? Well, we're not, just stopping in Cozumel. All the concerts are going to be on the ship. Okay. Because a lot of the cruises now, the, the artists fly in and play on the island and leave. Mm-hmm. You know, all the artists will be on the ship for the whole time. That's cool. That sounds like a really fun time. And another uh, Facebook question. This is from Bobby Ruppel. He asked, what are some of the challenges of running Side One Dummy? Um, th- to be honest, i got to say I don't run Side One Dummy. That's... Mm-hmm. Uh, Thomas, Bill, and Joe. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they're adjusting to the new way of streaming and marketing. Mm-hmm. By when we they sold the building recently and moved into a more space that they can use for, for uh, pop up stores mm-hmm. and events mm-hmm. as well as an office, uh, adapting for the times. Right. Yeah, that's definitely a common trend. So I have a, so a couple of final wrap up questions. You don't have to answer. So these okay. are kind of like the rapid fire questions. You don't have okay. to answer them quickly. You can elaborate more on them. But uh, when you think of the word successful, who's the first person that comes to mind? Bill Graham. What do the first or last 90 minutes of your day look like? Are there any daily routines, meditations, or mindfulness? Uh, I try to watch a sunset each morning, or sunrise, sunset, sunrise. not the sunset each morning. <laughs> sunrise each morning. I, I talk to my drivers, mm-hmm. get the feel of what happened on the road, um, just kind of breathe before it gets loud. Right. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I'm so exhausted <laughs> that literally I try to pick up a book and read a few mm-hmm. pages, and I get through about a page or two and pass out. Yeah. <laughs> so it takes me a whole summer to read a book then. <laughs> what, what piece of advice would you give to the, that student that's sitting in a classroom right now that is inspired by what you're doing and wants to get into the music business or the music industry, and what advice would you give them on how to get started? Well, get started as much as you can while you're in school in any kind of events, activities, your churches, whatever you do, go help plan events. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just think how you're going to kick my ass and put me out of business. <laughs> well, hopefully that will never happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and before I ask the, uh, the final question, what can people do to, to support you, support what you're doing? Where can they go on social media to, to learn yeah, more? Yeah, I'm pretty simple on social media. It's funny. I don't have secret names. It's Kevin Lyman on Twitter. <laughs> Kevin Warped uh, at AOL is my AOL address. Uh, and uh, I don't use Instagram. That I use it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but mostly right now it's been a lot of Twitter. Okay. And then before I ask the, the final question, I just want to thank you so much for, for taking the time for, for the podcast. But also thank you so much for how much you do to give back to to the world and to p- the students of the business and by all the philanthropic efforts you have through Warp Tour and just the passion that you've put behind all your businesses Great and thing. everything you do. It's very inspiring. Thank you very much. Working. Thanks for coming out early on a Saturday. Yeah, and then the final question is, what's your definition of making it? Definition of making it to me is sometimes having the time to have a great barbecue with your friends or now coming and speaking in Florida and being able to take tomorrow to go fishing. (laughs) That's making it to me. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right, thank you.